All right, everybody, welcome back to the OpenShift Commons. And today, as we want to do on Mondays, we're going to have an upstream uh, deep dive uh, AMA, Ask Me Anything session with the Rook Seth folks, um, Travis Nelson, uh, Sebastian Hahn, Annette Kluid are here with us. Um, there's a number of other folks joining in as well. Um, what we're going to do is have them do, you know, a bit of a deep dive introduction, all that good stuff, and then have live Q&A at the end of the session. So I'm going to let Travis introduce himself and his team and colleagues and um, rock and roll. And welcome back. Hope you've all recovered from KubeCon. Yes, thanks, Diane. It's good to be with you. Uh, Travis Nielsen, one of the Rook maintainers that originally created the product or project. Oh, wow, it's been about four years ago now. So it's, um, yep, excited to be here and, and talk about it. Uh, and Sebastian, you want to introduce yourself? Hello. Yep. So Sebastian Han, part of the storage BU, just like Travis, acting as a Rook maintainer for about two years now. Yeah, Annette Kluet, um been with Red Hat for four years, mostly uh, work on taking Rook uh, downstream and uh, in integrating with OpenShift. So with that, we'll dive into the slides here and talk about what is Rook and some architecture and uh, lots of good stuff. So first question, you might be asking, what is Rook? Why do I care about it? How can I use it in, uh, in my scenarios? So first, Rook is a completely open source uh, project. It is driven by the community and uh, community is, is first for us. It is a collection of operators for Kubernetes. We'll talk about more what that means, but basically if in Kubernetes we express things as desired state, we want things to be configured in our Kubernetes cluster and the operator is the way that that you get that done. It manages the deployment of your of your project. So in this case, today what we're going to dive into is how Rook automates management of the Ceph storage uh, software defined storage. Uh, so Rook as the operator it manages how to deploy the Ceph storage layer. It configures it for you. It uh, manages things like upgrades for you. Um, and yep. Yeah. Now let's get into uh, kind of overall project status before we dive into architecture. So the the Rook project has been a CNCF incubating project for about the past two years now. We're excited that we're in the graduation voting phase now. So any day now, we're hoping to get more votes and just finish off this, this graduation process. We've completed security reviews and um, hopefully crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's to, uh, to really, to be the first storage project that's graduated in the CNCF. So we're excited. Uh, we do have quarterly, quarterly releases uh, in Rook. The latest is version 1.4. Um, and that was just a couple of weeks ago here in early August. And then the next one uh, we'll look forward to in about the November timeframe. Uh, the project has been growing just phenomenally. Uh, it's you know, over 7,000 GitHub stars, 160 million container downloads from, from Docker Hub. And as far as how many people are contributing, you know, we're going on 300 unique contributors to the project. Of course, not all of those are, are active on an ongoing basis, but over time, it's, it's just been a great uh, testament to the, the community driven nature of, of the product and the project. Um, all right. So I'll hand it off to Annette for the next few slides. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. So the question is, before we get into the, the details of, of how Rook and Ceph work together, the question is, why use software-defined storage? Um, it turns out that we can support a lot more volume types if we're able to do that. Next slide. So, Ceph is the storage solution that we're going to be using with, with Rook. And as a storage solution, it's a about a 10-year open source project, so it's very mature. Um, 
it is able to support multiple types of volume types. And, and the software defined storage part essentially, because it's an abstraction, it's software, you, all that it really needs to support all of these different types of um, block, file, object, is, is really uh, raw block devices. So you, the actual storage backing stuff is a raw block device. It could be an NVMe drive, it could be a SSD, it could be a EBS2 volume, it could be an Azure uh, volume, it could be um, a, a VMware, it could be a, a pass-through disk in VMware or VMDK. So the actual backing storage is just the requirement is raw block. But out of that, when we put uh, Ceph orchestrated by Rook on top of it, then we get these different kinds of uh, storage types. Next slide, please. So what are the, at the level of um, OpenShift um, and, and workloads that we would find on OpenShift, what, what are some of the ways that we can use these different kinds of uh, volumes? So the first is with block volumes, um, until recently, we, we really would say that they could only support read, write, once types of applications. And, and they're very superior for um, supporting uh, database, transactional databases, and other kinds of applications. So again, these block volumes are so we usually call them Ceph Rados block device or RBD, Ceph RBD. And um, it is a type of, of storage that Ceph has uh, had available really the entire time that the project has been going. Um, the next thing relatively new for using um, block volumes is to use them for image storage for, for OpenShift virtual machines. This is what we call uh, Open, OpenShift Vert, used to be called uh, CNV. And what's nice is when we use uh, block volumes from, from Ceph for uh, the image storage, we, we, we actually have a volume type RWX, read, write many, on that, which allows uh, live migration of the VMs. This is really currently downstream. This is the only use of RWX for block volumes but um, it's, it's definitely a nice use uh, being able to migrate VMs. The next uh, type, file volumes. So applications, so, so the thing about file volumes that makes it um, a service that you, you might use is any kind of um, application that needs multiple writers to the same volume. So one example could be that if you scale out your registry, uh, you would need a, a read, write, many type of application. So um, this is supported via CephFS, and CephFS is, you know, compared to CephRBD, a newcomer to Ceph, but it's still probably, I mean, uh, Sebastian or Travis can, can uh, verify, but probably in the range of, you know, four or five years, and it is available as, as a service. The, the last service that's exposed is object storage, and again, this has been part of Ceph for quite a long time. Um, uh, R, 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 w, R, RGW, Rados Gateway, excuse me, the Rados Gateway um, service. And this allows um, in really any S3 compatible applications and whether they, those applications re reside in OpenShift or outside of OpenShift to, um, to retrieve and store objects into uh, Ceph. So again, you know, these, these are the reasons that we do all this is to be able to have um, all of these types of services really uh, with a, you know, a single backing store. So uh, very nice. So I think uh, at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Travis. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, Annette. And yeah, thanks for that overview of the different scenarios. The storage, there's so many scenarios to cover with storage between block, file, and object, and being able to do it with a single storage system with Ceph is, is really powerful, and it's proven powerful in the community. Um, yeah, and it's really something that makes slide. Ceph so oh, unique too. Oh, no, just wanted to add to that that this is also one of the things that makes Ceph so unique is that it provides all of these three storage interfaces 
where typically you would see uh, a software doing only block or only file system uh, or maybe only object, but self really provides the three of them. Right. That's all. <laughs> That's, yeah. Thanks. And then, so now we'll, we're planning on dri diving into the architecture um, to show at the next level what we're talking about. To, to get started, you know, when talking about OpenShift and Kubernetes, it, it's really a whole new set of terminology. So just to cover our um, basic definitions here, so an operator, first of all, is, you know, it's this daemon that is watching for changes to resources, or basically it, it's waiting for instructions on what desired state you want in the system. And then it, it's, it's the, it has the code that will go make it happen. Okay, it's the operator's job to, you know, just like um, a human operator who might be making things happen in a data center, the Rook operator or, or a Kubernetes operator is the thing that's automating what's happening in the cluster. Okay, a CRD is a, a custom resource definition. This is the extensibility uh, mechanism that Kubernetes has defined in their API to allow us to plug in our own types. So for example, with Rook, we've defined all the types we need to drive the Ceph storage. Um, and so the CRD is just the high level definition. A CR is basically one instance or one object of that resource that conforms to the CRD. And now getting into some of the Kubernetes storage terminology, a storage class is a definition of storage that, where you can request storage from it. This is not unique to Rook or, or Ceph. It's a general, you know, any, any storage plugging into Kubernetes uses a storage class. Along with that, a PVC, a purpose, persistent volume claim, is the way you attach your storage to a pod. And then the pod is you know, a group of containers that's running your uh, software managed by Kubernetes. So with that, um, you know, with when we got started on the Rook project, we were really looking at Ceph and seeing that, okay, Ceph is really powerful. Like we said, it has all the block object and file storage in one architecture. Now, how can we bring that to Kubernetes and OpenShift? How can we make it work well? It's complicated to set up. It's, um, you know, you have to hire someone really to, to deploy Ceph. And, and so we wanted to simplify that problem and make it a natural and integrated part of, of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So that's where Rook was born. Rook's job is to deploy the management or own the management of Ceph. Ceph as the storage layer, it's a, a long proven um, storage stack. We don't wanna rewrite storage every time you have a new platform like Kubernetes, we want the same stable storage platform. The, so the second layer of architecture, architecture is the CSI driver. So the CSI driver is what will allow you to dynamically provision the storage from Ceph and then attach it and mount it to your client pods in your cluster. And then the final layer is that Ceph provides the data layer. Once everything is set up in your cluster, you've got your storage attached, Rook and the CSI driver are really out of the picture and the data layer goes purely through Ceph daemons. And there's no, yep, no operator. The operator does not do anything with, with the data layer. All right, um, let's get into some diagrams here, maybe to help illustrate it a, a bit more. We've got some different colors. What these means. The, the blue, so all of these boxes on here are representing pods in the cluster. And each white box is a different node in your, your system. So on one node, we might have the Rook operator running as a pod. Uh, and Rook, the operator also starts up some other Rook daemons. We call these discovery daemons. So there's the discovery daemon, whoops, go back here, running on every node. And what it does is it goes out and discovers what's my hardware inventory. What, what devices do I have locally on each node? Okay. And from that point, 
Um, you've got the CSI drivers, so in green, the CSI drivers need to run on every node so we can attach provision and attach the storage. And then all of the red pods are the Ceph daemons. So Rook, Rook owns deploying those, those pods. Rook knows how to start up the Ceph monitors and the OSDs and all these different daemons in a way that you don't have to worry about all of the all the details of how to run the storage. Rook, Rook does that for you, automates it, and connect attaches it to the local storage in order to give you the software defined storage platform as a whole. But here you see like Ceph Mons have a little bit of metadata that they need to persist the disk. So they do need a local disk for that. And then the Ceph OSDs, um, that, that's where the main data is stored in a Ceph cluster, they, attach, they write to a local disk um, or a dynamically provisioned disk if you're in the cloud. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so that's layer one. Rook is deploying these all these daemons to start up your Ceph cluster. The so layer two, uh, the CSI driver. So how does a CSI driver interact with the applications? So let's say you have an, um, an application here on the left that needs block storage. So it needs to um, mount a volume. What it does is you define in your application a PVC or a, a persistent volume claim. And with block storage, usually that's going to be a read write once volume, which says, give me a volume. I'm the only one that can read and write to it. Nobody else has access to it. It's high performance. I don't have to worry about um, corruption from other anybody else writing to it. I'm the only writer to it. So I get I define my claim, which asks the storage class for an RBD volume, which then through the Kubernetes uh, storage infrastructure asks the CSI driver for the RBD volume. That volume is provisioned. It's and then it's mounted in your um, in your pod, and you now have access to read and write to that storage. Okay, so that's that's a basic block volume for your application. Uh, in the next section here, we've got well, what if you're what if you have two applications that need to share storage? You've got two, maybe two or more readers and writers. Uh, this is usually what we call an RWX or read write many volume claim in Kubernetes. So they both can request that volume. Um, they request the storage class now from a different driver. So the CephFS driver allows you to um, have multiple readers and writers. And then the CephFS, CephFS CSI driver provisions and, and allows you to mount that volume in multiple pods. And then the final type of storage we're talking about is object storage, where you know as a, you've got an S3 endpoint that Ceph provides with RGW, where you've got a bucket you want to read or put and get to an HTTP endpoint. Um, and in Rook, we've defined uh, some a concept similar to PVCs, where you can claim a bucket. And so you claim a bucket you ask a special type of storage class for that bucket. And then Rook has a bucket provisioner that um, gives you the, creates the bucket and allows you to access it from your pods and in, in your, your application pods. And that rounds up the, the three different types of storage for the CSI driver. Okay, then the final layer, you know, how does, after you've got your storage available, it's all mounted from the CSI driver. How does your application write to to the to the storage? How does that look like in the data path? So again, on the left, we've got the block storage. Your application is running in its pod. It just looks like it's any other read and write to. What happens under the covers is it's mounted through, or it's already been mounted with the CSI driver, and when you read and write to the Ceph cluster now, there's an RBD kernel driver that then connects to all of the Ceph daemons. And of course, 
you don't even have to think about how that works. Ceph handles all of the connection to the mons and OSDs um, and all, all those daemons to, to read and write to the data. Notice that there's no rook or CSI driver in the data path here. And similarly for file storage, we've got the read write many claims with CephFS and the these pods actually need to connect to this MDS Ceph daemon, which is the Ceph daemon that manages the you know the the locks and act basically multiple access points to the system. So there's no there's no corruption of the data. Um, that gives you the at that layer. And then finally, the object or S3 endpoint uses an S3 client, just like it would for any, you know, whether it's running in the cloud with Amazon S3, or now with Ceph, we have the, the endpoint provided through RGW. So your S3 client connects to the RGW endpoint in Ceph and, and gives you that. Okay, so those are the three layers to think about in Rook. So what does it take to get started? You know, we want to make it as easy as possible to deploy this storage. So we've done our best to make it to make it easy. Uh, easy may be an overstatement. Um, storage is never easy, um, but we hope it's simple enough to get started. There are, you know, the way we, you define things in OpenShift is through manifests or YAML files. Okay, so there are three YAML files. If you create these then basically you'll have a Rook and Ceph cluster up and running in minutes. So you have common.yaml that defines your RBAC settings, which RBAC is what control, control security settings uh, in OpenShift. Okay. Then you create the operator with operator.yaml. Of course, it's just a simple deployment. It starts up a single pod that will manage the Ceph cluster. And then finally, you create the Ceph cluster custom resource, which is this type that we've defined purely for Rook and Ceph to uh, manage the cluster. Now on the right here, what we've got is a, uh, an example um, YAML extract. There's a lot more settings than you see here. Uh, this is just to get started, but basically you can do things like say, well, what version of Ceph do I want to deploy? Um, in this case, that's the latest. Um, latest Octopus version 15.2.4. Then how many mons do I want? Um, three is the usual number. And then how do I want to deploy the storage using all nodes and devices? And there are ways to do that. But that gets a basic cluster started. And once the basic cluster started now, of course, your storage needs to consume it. So your admin needs to define a storage class. And then your application creates your PVC and, and starts up. This example on the right is what your what a simple application pod definition might look like as far as um, defining a PVC, uh, which is claiming from the RBD storage class in Rook. Yep. We don't want to get caught up on that YAML too much, so we'll continue. Now when you're playing Rook, the next question is you might ask, well, I've got my environment that's so much different from this other environment. Maybe I'm running in the cloud. Maybe I'm running in my data center. Where can Rook work? Well, Rook can run wherever OpenShift or Kubernetes runs. If, if they can run there, then, then Rook can consistently be deployed there as well. Primarily, people are going to be using it in either bare metal clusters uh, where they just there is no other option for, for software-defined storage. Like if I'm running on bare metal, I don't have uh, Amazon EBS, right? There's just, so I need Ceph to provide me that storage. But there are also scenarios for running Rook in the cloud, which uh, we'll talk more about. Um, when you're So when you configure Rook, you need to tell it, what storage devices to um, to request. You can do it where you request storage from a storage class where Rook is actually requesting storage from the cloud environment. So Rook can request to back 
set by EBS for if you are in the cloud. Um, if you're running on, on bare metal, commonly you would use a, a more direct form of device management where you're saying, hey, I've got raw devices, just use all available devices and partitions and let Ceph create the storage cluster out of that. Or next, you know, maybe you want explicit control over the nodes and devices, so you want to list them all in the cluster CR, and, and that, that's an option. And the last option we just added recently, which is called Ceph Drive Groups, where Ceph has this way to define in a very granular way what model numbers or other attributes you want to consume for the OSDs. Um, and you can define that in cluster CR as well. So uh, that's in a nutshell what to consider for how to start up Rook. As you think about your clusters and the topology you've got, you with storage, you really have to worry about failure domains. You want to make sure your data is highly available, it's durable. Um, and there are ways to distribute the Ceph daemons across the cluster to make sure the, uh, the failure domains are handled properly. And we've, we've done a good job, I think, of making that simple. So you just have to define a few attributes either on the nodes or labels on the nodes that say what, you know, what uh, failure domain does this node belong to? And then Rook will pick up on that and distribute your monitors and your OSDs across that with the Ceph crush hierarchy so that, uh, that that failure domain will be um, will be honored. You have to spread OSDs you know, evenly. You can do it with pod topology constraints if you're running a, a really, the latest version of, of OpenShift. Um, or you can tell Rook, hey, only run on specific nodes. So it's there's all there are many advanced options for how to deploy Rook and tell it which nodes and which devices. Um, simple cases don't require all of that, of course, but the flexibility is is there. Okay, so why would we want to run Ceph in a cloud environment uh, if I've already got the cloud um, storage available? Um, here here are the scenarios. So first of all, wherever Kubernetes or OpenShift are deployed, you know, you, it's good to have a, a consistent storage platform. Uh, next of all, the you, know, you there may be shortcomings of the cloud provider storage. Uh, some common ones are that storage are is limited to within an AZ. Um, maybe there's slow failover times, and you want failover time of seconds instead of minutes. Um, Cloud providers have limitations on the number of PVs per node. Um, I've heard um, of at least one, uh, one or two of them that have limits of say 30 PVs per node, which is, you know, which can be really limiting if you have a lot of small applications. And then also in cloud providers, when you request small volumes, you get perf characteristics of a small volume and it's going to, going to, um, run slower. With Rook, you can basically request a few large volumes and then Ceph abstracts all of these things away so that you get the perf characteristics of the underlying volumes, but the large volumes, the higher IOPS, the, the higher throughput. And then finally, uh, when you're running in the cloud, the the Ceph demons that need require persistence, the monitors and OSDs, they can be backed by PVCs, like I was saying earlier. No need to access for direct um, local devices. You can Ceph and Rook can request that storage. To, it just makes the deployment that much simpler. All right, so let's take a pause and see if there are any questions so far. Um, we do have questions in the chat. Yeah, Sebastian, if you want to read those couple out and then we can see if we can get Yeah, it. I think, the, um, so the first one is, 
basically asking to go back to the slide where we have the architecture layout of all mm -hmm. uh, how the Ceph daemons are basically deployed. And I think it's looking for Is clarification it? here. Yeah, I think this so, one. Which, which one? No, this one. Previous one. Okay. No, the one with, uh, no, 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 um, layer one. Yeah, this one, yeah. Layer uh, one. Okay. Yeah, that, layer this one. one. Yes, yes. So what is the clarification you're looking for? So the, are these three different Kubernetes clusters or what am I, what are we looking at, right? We're looking yeah, at a so full cluster are... here. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Travis. Yeah. So th this is trying to represent three nodes in a, okay. a single cluster. Okay. Um, and yeah, each, each box on each node is supposed to be a pod that's, that's running in the cluster. These are worker nodes or master nodes, or does it matter? Um, you can choose to deploy them on master if you want. Most people, I think, would not run them on masters. But if you add the right operations, then, then they can run on masters. Okay, thank you. And I'm not sure I understand the question too, but basically the question too is how does pod get closest Ceph backend for its use of lower latency? Um, can uh, you just clarify the question, please? Sure. If we have multi-node self deployment inside a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster, imagine a pod based on the worker node one, but getting attached to a block storage on another node. Does self provide or root provides any intelligence to pick up the right closest backend, I would say, node for low, lower latency? Okay, so I guess, so basically the answer to that question is no. Although we have features like uh, read affinities where you could be reading data from, let's say the closest OSD. But I would say that to really answer that question, we will have to dive a little bit more on uh, the design of Ceph itself. Yeah, this is not really how Ceph uh, is designed. Uh, Ceph is really designed for, for scaling, so we don't really do things like uh, locally attached um, uh, storage for, for your pods. You're just basically getting a lot of aggregation from all the OSDs and all the desks uh, running, and then this is how you get your performance. But in, we in, are, the, in, yeah. in this presentation, the gentleman mentioned that we can replace local node storage as the block storage with Ceph. It is Where, correct, yeah. But the value of local node storage is low latency and high IOPS because the local node storage is usually NVMEs and so on and so forth. If you're gonna swap them out, you better offer similar capabilities by means of IOPS and, and latency, don't you think? This is true, but I think there are different use cases. If you are really requiring, uh, if you have an application that is really high ops intensive, then you may, you might be willing to dedicate a, an entire block device, and then you can localize reads and writes. But as soon as your application, I guess, is distributed, then things become a little bit different too. Um, and also, when you do direct attached devices, you're kind of losing some flexibility too, um, because you will have to use the entire block device because today uh, on the Bermuda world, uh, we don't really have the notion of uh, partitioning drives and things like this. Uh, these are topics uh, we're actively working on, but if you would have to ask for um, a block PV, then you will have to consume it entirely. So okay, I, I guess these you. are really different use cases. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. And just to add to that, you know, I, it's definitely a different scenario where if you really need local storage, high you know, high IOPS, and if you have replication at the app, application layer, like if your Cassandra database is replicating at its layer and you don't need the local uh, or Ceph to replicate the data for you, then then Ceph it, you know, isn't going to be the right answer. You should just use a local device and you get all the local um, it's a, that performance. So Ceph, and there is work in progress to make it so you can have data locality within a, a zone. Um, it will help coordinate that and, and mount the 
you know, give preference to certain OSDs based on that that zone affinity. Uh, but you, but CEP isn't at the end of the day designed to give you local node affinity. Okay, so we have two more questions in the chat, and I think once we have answered them, we can proceed with this with the slides. So the third question is for cloud environments, why not use S3 instead of CEP object storage? So, uh, well, I guess typically um, when you, and this is what Travis mentioned, maybe we can move forward. Can you move forward, Travis? Like one or two slides, I guess, maybe? Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, this, yeah, the previous one, I guess, layer two. If you do a little close up on layer two, um, on the on the right hand side, and we have the the bucket claim. So, let's say I'm a I'm a developer and uh, my application works with S3, and I just want to be able to connect to it and write objects. What I really care about at this point is uh, to get a bucket. So. I don't really want to claim for a full uh, S3 endpoint, but I just want to claim for a bucket and a user, and then I can start writing. So this is essentially what you get when you use Rook through that bucket interface. Um, and although, again, you, I think you can also argue that you could use straight S3 at this point, but I think we also have to see it from the perspective of the overall experience from that backend, you can, not only do object, but you can do files and blocks. So because you get everything, it's probably easier to manage this entire storage interfaces through a single storage entity. Yeah, that's a good question though. I would say probably most people running in the cloud would, would use S3 directly instead of using Rook with this, um, this layer on top, but yeah, there are scenarios like like Sebastian said, I think, for consistency and having the bucket provision in. Um, but yep. Yeah. And was there one more question? Yeah, I think there's one more. So the last question is, is there is there any ability to run a backend network for cluster replication and front end replication? So I'm gonna touch that on uh, the next slide. So essentially the answer is yes. We can segregate the storage network from the client one. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see, I think it's a good segue to uh, actually start discussing the key features for, for Rook. So thanks, Thank Travis. You. Thanks, thanks Annette, uh, for the introduction. Uh, now that we're really familiar with uh, uh, the Rook architecture and all the storage interfaces we have, let's dive into some of the best features that Rook provide. And in here in is, is a really interesting one. Uh, typically, when we think about upgrades, uh, you always think about this painful, maybe long-lasting process uh, where you just don't know what, in which um, errors you're going to end up to, and it, it's a uh, it, it is non-trivial most of the time. But it's yet, I guess, another beauty of uh, the operator world uh, is because we have embedded all of that operational logic into a logical entity, so basically an operator, then we just basically aggregated, aggregated years of experience to run upgrades over any any versions of Ceph. And now what we have today is actually really smooth. So we have what we have to differentiate here is two types of upgrades. So the first one is the upgrade of Rook uh, itself. So the upgrade of the, the operator. Uh, and the upgrade of the Rook operator is almost as simple as changing the image in the spec, as well as following following some upgrade steps in the documentation guide. So uh, maybe we have to update some R bags, uh, things like that. But essentially, it's really about changing the image in the deployment spec, and then you will get a new version of your Rook operator. And the second upgrade we have to do is the upgrade of the storage itself, so the backend storage. In this case, Ceph. And again, uh, at this point, the upgrade is really as simple as changing the image of the Ceph cluster CR uh, spec specification. At this point, once Rook intercepts that CR update and it realizes that it is a new Ceph version, 
it will simply go ahead and upgrade the cluster. It will upgrade nodes by nodes, disks by disks, and always make sure in between that everything is healthy and will proceed uh, with the upgrade. Next slide, please. Exynoc, oh, um, CSI driver. So Kubernetes has gone through several iteration that when it comes to we, with attaching storage, uh, that attaching persistent storage to containers. Back in the days, we, we had the entry drivers, then we, we had flex, um, and, and more recently, uh, we had the CSI spec for container storage interface. Essentially, it is a connector, uh, just like Travis mentioned earlier, that allows you to provide persistent storage to your containers. With the newest release of Rook 1.4, we have implemented and integrated the 3.0 spec. Well, actually, Seth CSI implemented the 3.0 CSI spec, and Rook has integrated that new CSI version in its engine. And again, uh, you can see that we support whether we whether you do block storage or, or file system, we support all the dynamic provisioning storage interfaces uh, and access method, like RW, RWX, uh, and ROCKS. What's new with that particular 3.0 release is snapshots and cloning. So this is a functionality that has been around in Ceph for, for years now, but Kubernetes just started to surface those uh, volumes capabilities and we, we have early support for that. Because Rook supports a wide range of Kubernetes versions, we continue to support Flex Driver. So it is more in the maintenance mode. Uh, you can still use it. But obviously, it is highly encouraged to, to go with the Step CSI driver. Right, please. External cluster connection. Because not everything is always greenfield, but most of the users have existing set clusters that they might have deployed with Puppet or Ansible or manually maybe, and they still want to consume it. Or maybe it's something else is already consuming it. Uh, maybe they use OpenStack and this existing set cluster is backing OpenStack for block storage, but they now have a use case where they are starting to, they have started to run applications in Kubernetes. So they, they really want to take advantage of that cloud native experience, but they don't really have to redeploy a new SAP cluster within Kubernetes with Rook. So at this point, what they can do is still use Rook and CSI, but Rook at this point will be more in a um, consumer, relationship, consumer-producer relationship, where Rook only connects to an external cluster and does not do any management whatsoever. It only connects and consume the storage from that particular cluster and give to Ceph CSI all the credentials, all the details so that dynamic provisioning can happen. So if you look at, um, at the CR spec, which is fairly small here. In the spec of the Ceph cluster, what we say is, essentially, we want to deploy a new cluster that is called Rook Ceph external, and we just enable the external spec. Uh, along with that, we have helper scripts to inject the right metadata in the Kubernetes environment. And once Rook sees uh, those secrets and config maps, then it will go ahead and bootstrap uh, the connection. So it is basically as simple as this. As an extension of this, not only you can consume uh, block and file system resources from an external set cluster, but you can also uh, consume object store, object storage. So by passing an endpoint, um, you have Rados gateways running. They might be running independently, but most likely they're running um, besides uh, a load balancer. So you just get the IP of that load balancer and you inject it uh, in Rook and then Rook will go ahead and will allow you to consume uh, the bucket interface. 
So you can claim for bucket and S3 users and credentials. Still along with that, we, we have really nice capabilities with Prometheus and Kubernetes. And one of the use cases we, we might have is, even though you run, uh, even though you don't run Ceph in Kubernetes per se, you could still take advantage of your Prometheus instances and then collect metrics and alerts just by actually adding the monitoring endpoint that is already running from your external set cluster. So it is really simple. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through this one one more time, but Travis already mentioned it. Object bucket provisioning. It is simply the equivalent of the block storage interface and the PVC interface. And it's just that this is not a volume at this point, it's a bucket because what you're looking for here is in order to get the work done, you need a bucket and then you need S3 credentials. Once you have that, you also get the S3 endpoint and then you can start working. So essentially it's the same as requesting for, for, for volume, but you don't claim for volume, you claim for a bucket. And this current interface is actually uh, undergoing a huge refactor when we want to make it COSI compliant uh, using the CSI-like spec uh, to integrate, where today it is a library called libbucket provisioner that has been integrated into Rook. And with that, Rook is capable of responding to what we call OBC requests. Uh, but in the future, this would be handled just like a traditional PVC interface. So this will be a, added in the core of, of Kubernetes. Next slide, please. Maltus, so it is coming back uh, straight to the question we had in the chat earlier. If you have been, if you had deployed Ceph already maybe years ago with Bermuda, then you know that it's always highly recommended to separate network interfaces uh, from client to the external storage. So, at this point, what you want to do is really have a dedicated network for the replication. So Ceph has its own internal replication network. Then you have you want to you want this one to be dedicated. Then there is the Ceph to clients network, and this one you also want it to be running on a dedicated network. Today we don't have so many options to achieve that. One of them is clearly to use host networking, where by doing so, you just expose all the network interfaces from all the hosts, or from, from the host inside your container, which has some really high security implications, obviously. That's why we have started implementing uh, Maltus, uh, because Maltus is essentially the answer to that question. And uh, the question is, I want to be able to attach multiple dedicated interfaces into one container and I want to specify which one I want to use and this um, this has to be done in a securely fashion uh, through them spaces not just exposing the entire network stack so early support is there in Rook it's just that in order to get this really complete um, a couple of moving pieces need to well I guess continue to, to move such as the integration with IPAM whereabouts uh, which is the preferred one and they are um, the, the, the the picture is not fully complete, so there is lack of services support. So you cannot create a service and then have a service backing uh, expose uh, dedicated network interfaces uh, like Kubernetes services. And there is also one small item we still have, we still need to fix on this CSI driver to be complete. And I just realized that we have eight minutes left or so. So um, I need to speed up a little bit. Next slide, please. Come here real quick. I just want to emphasize that we do have a number of people running in production with the separate cluster network, but like Sebastian said, it's just with the host networking option, and then you tell there's a way to tell the Ceph demons, the OSDs, how to run on that separate network. But Multis will be a much better solution coming. Soon. Yeah, it's it's All really right. at this point it's really a matter of super of the infrastructure supporting that scenario because Ceph has been supporting that for, for years now. 
uh, yeah. moving on with admission controller. Uh, the admission controller really helps us validating uh, creation of custom resources as well as updates, just to make sure that uh, we don't run into an invalid configuration. So there are examples where some values cannot be modified. Let's say on day one, I'm starting with host networking. And then in the middle of the of like the life of my cluster, I decide that I want to go full SDN. This cannot be done. And in order for this to be prevented, uh, an admission controller is, reuse, is really useful because the admission controller will basically intercept the CR update request and will actually refuse to acknowledge it depending on how, uh, like on which validation rule uh, have been applied. And this will actually happen even before the operator realizes that an update has been made. So it won't go into any reconciliation loop, which is really useful. Next slide, please. Toolbox job. We have a component called a toolbox, which is essentially a toolbox that has the Ceph binaries in it and a connection to the Ceph cluster. So if you're familiar with Ceph, then you will get an environment where you can run Ceph commons, apply Ceph commons, and perhaps maybe debug your cluster too. Uh, we have been using this uh, new mechanism now to execute uh, jobs where we don't require any manual intervention, so you don't have to be a staff expert. You don't. You just need to run these jobs, and and then the, the engine will just do the rest for you. Uh, the idea is to really facilitate uh, use cases like, for example, removing a failing OSD. So you, one of your drives is failing, and you have to replace it. So instead of going through manual uh, CLI comments, then if you run that job, then um, everything will be done automatically. And we'll, we are, well, we're still working on improving this again to have predefined jobs uh, embedded into, into Rook. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, one uh, less operational thing to do. Next slide, please. I think we have a few yeah. questions in. Um, should we go to the questions and then come back to this? If we I, have think, I think it's the last one. I think it's the last one. No. Is this the last one? Okay. Real quick. I think it is. So real quick, um, Rook has cleanup policies. So when you remove, when you decide to remove the self cluster, and then if you apply that policy, Rook will go ahead and remove all the pods uh, and, and the demons. And also, it will also it will remove um, all Ceph's demons data. Uh, can be directories, can be drives. Um, different options are supported. So basically, it will uh, give you a clean environment once the cluster goes away. And I think with that, we can we can go back to. Sounds good. Now I'll go back. Yeah. Yeah. Back to questions. Yeah. So um, face. Uh, Fadi, Fadi's question. Um, not sure what you mean by performing the storage management, but but certainly you could have a single external Ceph cluster utilized by by multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters. So if you can explain the the storage management, I mean you 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 can't have the same volume used by applications in different Kubernetes clusters. So, Fadi, do you? Yeah, so, so my, my question is obviously you cannot use the same volume attached to multiple pods. That, that's not my intent of question. The question is you have you have an investment as a software defined storage with the external self cluster where you can plug in your Kubernetes cluster with the Rook operator into this. My question is can I plug in multiple Kubernetes clusters with each has their own Rook operator and leverage this backend as a single storage backend. That's the question. Yeah, I, I believe the answer is yes. You can do that. Yeah. You would, you yeah, you would have different storage classes okay. obviously in each cluster. Okay, so if if so, how do you perform multi-cluster Kubernetes storage management? Because there are 
So obviously each rook operator will try to perform their own operations on this stuff cluster, but none of them are actually, you can call them as a master. Yeah, but uh, so I'll, I'll let uh, Travis and, and Sebastian chime in, but there's no management done by rook of an external stuff cluster. It's not but, managing that cluster. But there was a custom resource definition that perform OST removal if it is failing from a cluster. Uh, yeah, but this is uh, only valid when you have a converged cluster, not, oh. when, not when we are connected to an external cluster. So okay. yes, the, you can have multiple Kubernetes cluster accessing the same external self cluster. They will all be using different pools. So the, stor the storage will be isolated underneath. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the use case. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's one, one, to, one too many. Yeah. So we are almost at the end of the hour, but there is one question from John Sherwood um, that that might take us back a little ways. But does Rook handle the crush map placement group changes when you add more OSDs and cluster nodes? Is that a quick question or something we need to follow up with? It is some kind of quick question. Yeah, yeah. the answer is yes. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the when you add nodes or you know, when you add more storage rooks will create the osds automatically depending on the settings in your in your cluster cr but yeah rook will look for labels on those the new nodes you're adding and then add the new osds into the crush map according to you know the labels on that nodes you know the labels should tell you is it in this which zone is it in which rack or or other topology labels so we do look for those and add that automatically. So I know you had a couple of slides at the end on how people can get a hold of you. Um, and join. Um, here, here's the slide with our email addresses and our, the Rook website. Uh, there, the main place to, that we have discussions really is in the Rook Slack. So if you go to the Rook.io, you'll see a link to join Slack. And love to hear from you and talk more about it. Perfect. I think that was um, great content. I'm going to look forward to seeing Rook graduate through the CNCF and um, get a few other people off vacation so that they can vote for you guys and vote it up. Um, and hopefully we can do this again once you're a graduated project and maybe take a deep dive into the roadmap next and where you're going next with Rook and with Seth. And what's up? I think that would be even another another thing of interest. It's obviously some really interesting um, use cases for this and telco and other places. So hopefully um, everybody got what they needed out of today and we'll do this again soon. So thanks Travis and Sebastian and Anne for taking the time to do this. Thank you. I will, I will be uploading this to the YouTube channel, um, which is RH OpenShift um, on YouTube and um, putting a link to the slides there. So um, if you are taking copious notes, don't worry, the slides will be public as well. Thanks a lot, Dan. Sounds good. We'll follow up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Recording has stopped. Hey, guys, that was perfect. Um, thanks a lot. And everybody who asked questions, those were